five, four, three, two, one. The Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order, and without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess of the Committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitations in the rule. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address or contact full Committee staff. As a reminder to members, please keep your video function on at all times even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. And consistent with House rules, staff will only mute members as appropriate <laughs> when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum, and I now recognize myself for opening remarks. Before, though, we uh, begin the hearing, I want to recognize our newest member to the committee, and that is Congresswoman Sheila Serfluris McCormick from the great state of Florida. We welcome you to this committee and look forward to working together with you. Congratulations. <clears throat> Good to have you. Pursuant to notice, the full committee meets today to discuss the United States strategy toward sub-Saharan Africa. And so let me start by thanking Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Molly Fee, and USAID's Assistant Administrator for Africa, Mande Muyangwa, for appearing before our community today. Just a few months ago, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken traveled to South Africa to announce a renewed American approach to Sub-Saharan Africa and that reframes the region's importance to the United States national security interests. <clears throat> and I want to get into the substance of the strategy in a moment, but I think it's important to discuss why this reframing is necessary in the first place. For far too long, perceptions of Africa have been shaped by outdated and uninformed depictions of a region in constant crises. And roughly four years of disparaging comments and misguided policies of the previous administration set relations with many of our African partners back decades. To get back on the right track with our African partners, a serious and critical cost correction was required. And that's why I applaud the Biden administration for developing a bold and ambitious U.S. strategy towards sub-Saharan Africa. Many observers agree that Africa, the second most populous region in the world, will shape the future. By 2050, one out of every four people on the globe will be African. African nations comprise nearly 30% of the United Nations, and the UN estimates that there are roughly 650 million cell phone users in Africa, more than in the United States or Europe. When it comes to critical minerals and other resources, it is hard to overstate how important this region is to the global effort to modernize our economies and combat climate change. Once the African continental free trade area is fully implemented, Africa stands to become the fifth largest economy in the world. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that foreign partners in the private sector and public sectors alike continue to expand their engagement with, the press, with their presence in Africa. And while opportunities in Africa abound, we must be clear-eyed about the challenges that negatively affect stability and undermine economic growth. When I meet with African leaders from across the continent, Common themes emerge and continue to resonate with me. African people of all backgrounds and income levels <clears throat> favor democracy and strongly prefer America's democratic values. Yet, we continue to see governments in parts of Africa give way to autocratic and anti-democratic movements. Africa has experienced more coups than any other region since 1950, <clears throat> with recent trends headed in the wrong direction. So we need to take the opportunity this strategy provides to acknowledge the governance challenges facing the region and identify what actions state and USAID should undertake to fortify democracy in Africa. The demand signal for democracy is clear. We must step up to meet the moment. 
The United States is in a prime position to redouble efforts to strengthen democracy, support good governance, and address the conditions associated with democratic backsliding, like endemic poverty and human rights abuses. I have always been a strong proponent of engaging our African partners with an emphasis on equity and agency, ensuring African stakeholders have a seat at the table and lead the change we all want to see in many parts of the continent. What I find most promising about the administration's strategy is that it outlines a clear and modern approach to enhancing our African, our engagement in Africa. And it rightly calls for leveraging the private sector and the African diaspora, bolstering civil society, supporting sustainable development, including through support for an equitable energy transition, strengthening trade and investment, and driving digital transformation on the continent. What will be key for this discussion is how. How are the State Department and USAID deploying their tools and resources to make this strategy successful? What resources are required to advance U.S. foreign policy objectives in Africa? And how can Congress be most helpful in this effort? So I look forward to the answers to these questions and the discussion that follows. And I now will recognize Mr. McCall for his opening statements. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and welcome to our new committee room. I, uh, I told the chairman I think I'm cursed when I chaired Homeland Security Committee. I got moved out of the beautiful committee room to here. But, uh, but it's nice and it's close to votes. But uh, it's great to see all of you uh, back here again. And uh, I want to say uh, first on Africa that, uh, and thank the witnesses too, uh, ensuring strong engagement with our African partners has been and remains a bipartisan priority. And for over two decades, under both Republicans and Democratic administrations, uh, the U.S. has partnered with African nations to address key challenges. Next year will be the 20th anniversary of President Bush's launch of PEPFAR, which um, in many, uh, as I talk to leaders in Africa, say saved a, a generation from extinction. I look forward to ensuring that this important work continues uh, in the next Congress and be reauthorized. The U.S. has a legacy and a depth of investment of which to be proud. In the last year, the United States provided over a billion COVID vaccines to African countries uh, and funding to address unprecedented levels of food insecurity and famine in the Horn of Af Africa. Uh, but we need to also think long-term about our investments. And while the U.S. offers partnership, the PRC and Russia seek to leverage their offers of financing and security guarantees for their own political, economic, and security priorities. A perfect example of this is the CCP's debt trap diplomacy through their Belt and Road Initiative. And, um, and Secretary, you and I talked about this, and if we're not on the field, Mr. Chairman, you can't win if you're not on the field, and we need to get on, on, the, on the field. Um, and again, when I meet with our partners and allies all over the world, they do ask uh, and ask why they're entering into these dangerous agreements with China. Uh, they tell me, again, because it's, we're not there, and we need to be there. We can't allow the CCP and Russia to exert their malign influence over the continent. Promoting two-way trade and investment with African nations and creating economic opportunity must be a top priority. And that's why I'm proud that my bill, the Championing American Business Through Diplomacy Act, uh, was signed into law. Earlier this year, I introduced legislation to codify the Prosper Africa Initiative. And I want to thank Chairman Meeks, for his co-sponsorship and helping us get that uh, marked up. This effort uh, coordinates the various tools of the U.S. government to speak with one voice and support U.S. companies looking to invest in Africa. <clears throat> I am con have some concerns, as uh, Secretary, as you and I talked about, about the, um, the Development Finance Corporation that I worked uh, very hard, and many members on this committee did, uh, to get private investment. Uh, I believe this administration is putting a lot of restrictions on that uh, investment as it has to, be, has to be certain types of energy and has to have all sorts of restrictions. And I've heard from the private sector that this has really um, stalled our ability to have that private investment. Um, I think that um, 
With the invasion of Ukraine by Putin and the world's rush to secure oil and gas from alternative regions reveals that we, we can't really uh, keep uh, the DFC hamstrung from investing in traditional energy. Uh, it can only be green. Uh, we were in Romania. <clears throat> they, wanted to, they wanted to have these small modular nuclear reactors, uh, Madam Secretary, and we were told the Development Finance Corporation would not finance that because it was not, quote, unquote, green energy. However, nuclear power has zero carbon emissions, and even the EU Parliament uh, voted that nuclear is green energy. So I, I think that's a, an issue on energy we need to focus on. Uh, we still have the, the counterterrorism issues there that I dealt with when I chaired Homeland, ISIS, Al Qaeda. Now, anytime you have instability, poverty, uh, you have these terror groups, Al Shabaab, well financed. Um, ISIS affiliates are active in over 20 African countries, um, and they're growing. Uh, I think passing the Global Fragility Act was an important step to stabilize Africa through a whole of government approach. Uh, back then it was Chairman Engel and Senator Graham and Coons and myself. And so um, I really look forward to hearing about the implementation of that as well, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Secretary, um, towards implementation in West Africa and Mozambique. I'm also proud that uh, the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership Act, which was stalled by the Senate uh, uh, last uh, Congress was enacted earlier this year to improve U.S. response to terror threats in the Sahel. So we have many challenges, a lot of work to do. It's time to roll up our sleeves and get things done. And I want to thank both of you for being here today. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. <clears throat> I now recognize for one minute, uh, her title is still the chair of the uh, Africa Subcommittee. It soon will be the mayor of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, the Honorable Karen Bass is now recognized for one minute. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for convening this hearing and for the opportunity to speak on the importance of President Biden's Africa strategy. As noted in the Biden administration's Africa strategy, it is impossible to meet this era's defining challenges without African contributions and leaderships. The strategy is a much needed effort to, quote, recast traditional U.S. policy priorities, democracy and governance, peace and security, trade and investment and development as pathways to bolster the region's ability to solve global problems alongside the U.S. Throughout my time in Congress, I have worked to shift the paradigm from seeing Africa as a continent that is defined by crisis, conflict, poverty and corruption to engaging Africa as a continent with immense opportunities for robust and mutually beneficial partnerships. Um, I, I have led several delegations to the continent with members of Congress, and every time they come back, they're always amazed at the richness of the continent. But let me just conclude by um, thanking you. I know that this will probably be my last hearing. And uh, the most difficult part of my decision to leave Congress was really because of the work of this committee. And so uh, I look forward to elevating uh, international affairs in an international city. And I just want to express my appreciation to our wonderful chairman and ranking member, soon to switch roles, and uh, um, soon to be chairman uh, Chris Smith for the partnership that we've had over the last 12 years and all the members of this committee. So thank you for the opportunity to address you. Let me thank you, uh, Chairwoman Mayor, uh, for mm -hmm. your dedication. Uh, for surely uh, this is the most appropriate uh, last uh, committee hearing that you attend because of your focus, your lifelong focus, even before you became a member of Congress to the continent of Africa. You've always been one that I've depended upon and, leaded and leaned on uh, when it came to the continent. And your vision for the continent uh, is absolutely, absolutely superb. Uh, and it leads to many of the things uh, that has helped me uh, as a member of the House and as chair of this committee. Uh, and you uh, will not escape, though, because I will still be calling the mayor of LA uh, on various things, particularly 
as it uh, regards the continent of Africa. So thank you for your service to the United States Congress, and thank you for your service to this committee. Uh, we uh, are deeply indebted to you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and if I could echo that sentiment, uh, uh, Karen, it's been a real joy to work with you. Your positive uh, energy is infectious, and we've worked on many initiatives related to Africa uh, together that have, I think, made a difference. Um, and that's what it's all about, really. I congratulate you on your new position as mayor of LA. You may enjoy being an executive more than just a, one of 435. So we, uh, we're going to miss you. I hope you come back to visit. I yield back. Thank you. I now yield to a person who's been a partner because, you know, oftentimes when I talk to Representative Bass, the next mayor, uh, she always told me how she worked very well uh, with Mr. Smith for over the years. Uh, and so I recognize now uh, Mr. Representative Chris Smith. Thank you very minute. much, Mr. Chairman. And Karen, we are going to miss you. Uh, it's been a great partnership for many years, a dozen years. We've traveled together. I never remember very well when we traveled to Ethiopia. You, you came all the way from L.A., and as things turned out, you went back right away. I, I don't think you slept for about three days. But we had some really good meetings with the new prime minister. Unfortunately, then he disappointed. But now we have a peace agreement that hopefully will, will flourish. You're taking over what is the equivalent of a small country, four million people. Uh, and um, you know, know that you have a lot of friends on both sides of the aisle. And it's always been a, a real joy to work with you. Um, our staffs have worked very closely together. And I think that's extremely important. So we're going to miss you, Karen. And, but don't be a stranger. Uh, Look forward to seeing you over and over again going forward. Run that clock back to a minute. That's not oh, his good. time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, just a couple of things I'd like to raise uh, as we meet. It's good to see uh, Ambassador Molly Fee. Um, I remember when we met in Sudan um, uh, in the past, uh, South Sudan, I should say, and I appreciate your, your work. And, of course, to um, the um, uh, Mo Yangua. Uh, congratulations to you uh, for your work. Just a couple of brief things, uh, you know, because this is an important hearing, and I thank the chair for calling it. Uh, you know, as the prime author of the Frank Wolf International Religious Freedom Act, uh, I am concerned that in the strategy, and I, you know, have read it, read it carefully, uh, <laughs> that religious freedom is not there. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, I have, particularly in Nigeria and a number of other countries, whether it be Muslim on Muslim or Christian Muslim uh, fights, uh, these issues have to be front and center and not in any way, uh, we can't look askance when in Nigeria, and I disagree with the administration when they uh, got rid of CPC status for uh, Nigeria. I think, you know, the country itself, particularly the Christians, there's been a spike uh, in death to Christians that is because they are Christians in Nigeria. And I hope that we can come back to uh, redesignating de Buhari and his government as a CPC a country because they have not earned getting off that. On Nigeria, uh, on uh, Dear Congo, real quick, uh, I chaired a hearing on July 14th of the Tom Lantos Commission, and we focused on cobalt mining. Uh, and we had a number of unbelievably in, uh, incisive witnesses, including two Dira Congolese, who told us how 35 to 40,000, some estimates are a little bit lower, but that's order of magnitude, children are in those mines uh, getting cobalt. And who's running them? The Chinese Communist Party. Uh, they, are, they are taking over because they want to have the monopoly on electric cars going forward. Now, if you want an electric car, great, but it shouldn't be on the backs of little children and people who are adults who are exploited as well. So I hope we can really, really raise that issue to the highest possible level. Uh, hearing about how kids are dying, getting cancer, going in the mines without any kind of protection whatsoever. So uh, I'm deeply concerned about that as well, and I thank you. Yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. I now introduce our witnesses. Ambassador Molly Fee. She's a career member of the Senior Foreign Service with the rank of Minister Counselor and has served as U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs since last September and most recently served as Deputy Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation. Her experience in African Affairs includes serving as U.S. Ambassador to South Sudan, Deputy Chief of Mission in Ethiopia, and Chief of Staff for the, the Special Envoy for Sudan and South Sudan. Assistant Secretary Fee has extensive experience in UN engagement in Africa and the Middle East and began her career at several uh, Middle Eastern posts 
including Jordan, Egypt, and Kuwait. Dr. Mande Muyangwa was appointed as Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Africa in September and has over 25 years of leadership experience on Africa and U.S.-African relations, including the, in the areas of development, gender, education, housing, health, and nutrition. She previously served as the director of the Africa program at the Woodrow Wilson Center, academic dean at the Africa Center for, Street, for Strategic Studies, Strategic Studies, and professor of civil military relations at ACSS. She served on the board of trustees at Freedom House, the board of directors at the Elizabeth Glass, Glasser Pediatric AIDS Foundation, the International Advisory Council of Afrobarometer, and the Advisory Council in the Ibrahim Index of African Governance. So I want to thank our witnesses uh, for being here today, and I now yield to uh, Ambassador the Honorable Molly Fee, Deputy Secretary, I should say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member McCall, Subcommittee Chair Bass, Subcommittee Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for devoting your time today and to share your interest in Africa. As you know, the Africa strategy of the Biden-Harris administration is based on a simple but important premise. Building a 21st century partnership with Africa is critical to meeting this era's defining challenges and achieving results on our shared global priorities. As Secretary Blinken has said, Africa is a geopolitical force that will shape the world's future. The continent is home to the fastest growing and youngest population in the world, enjoys breathtaking ecological diversity, and nurtures vibrant and historic cultures whose past is inseparably intertwined with our own. The strategy commits to elevating, broadening, and deepening our partnerships with diverse African audiences, including notably the diaspora. We will prioritize listening and acting on what we hear. Even when we have disagreements, we will seize the opportunity to engage and discuss. The administration's national security strategy and the State Department USAID joint regional strategy for Africa recognize the profound transformation of the continent, capture the region's importance to US national security interests, and identify how we will boost Africa's ability to maximize opportunities and counter challenges. The upcoming US Africa Leader Summit is a prominent example of how we are putting this reframing into practice. President Biden also made this point at the UN when he announced US support for permanent seats on the Security Council for countries in Africa. The strategy's first objective is to foster openness and open societies, building on the hunger of African publics for foundational values, democracy, transparency, accountability, equity, inclusivity, rule of law, anti-corruption, and religious freedom, we will support those who understand that incorporating these values into governance is the best path to unlock the potential and prosperity of individuals and societies. Choice is also central to our second objective, to deliver democratic and security dividends. Poor governance and abusive security forces render countries vulnerable to instability. We will direct U.S. programming to address the drivers of conflict, strengthen democratic institutions, and invest in the development of local security forces that are capable and accountable. Thanks to Congress, we now have an innovative new tool with the Global Fragility Act. Poor governance also affords space for malign actors, such as the Kremlin-backed Wagner Group. We are engaging our African partners to counter Russia's malign influence. We are also working intentionally to present our African partners with alternatives to substandard Chinese practices while remaining open to collaboration when U.S., Chinese, and African interests align. Our third objective is to advance pandemic recovery and economic prosperity. We have provided millions of COVID-19 doses and, and billions of dollars in COVID-related support. The additional resources provided by Congress for food security and humanitarian assistance have been invaluable in mitigating the compounding effects of Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine. We are committed to helping our African partners strengthen health systems for the next global health challenge, building on the foundation of decades of investment. One example, in recent weeks, the State Department has been a leader in the U.S. government team helping Uganda effectively respond to an Ebola outbreak. 
The strategy also includes plans to promote economic growth, especially job creation. We are working through multilateral banks as well as U.S. government programs you know well, the DFC, MCC, Prosper Africa, Power Africa, and Feed the Future. We need to do more and better in this space, and we look for your support and guidance as we seek to advance new initiatives such as PGII. Finally, in line with the fourth pillar, we will support conservation, climate adaptation, and a just energy transition. At COP27 last week, President Biden announced more than $150 million to accelerate the implementation of the President's emergency plan for adaptation and resilience across Africa. This funding will help address what African counterparts highlight as their most urgent need in responding to the climate crisis especially as facilitating access to finance for populations vulnerable to climate change. As we enter this decisive decade, we firmly believe that Africans should and must have a seat at the table. Our challenges are shared, and so too should be our solutions. I look forward to addressing your questions. And Mr. Chairman, if I might, I'd like to speak on behalf of the State Department to honor and thank Congresswoman Bass, for her leadership on Africa issues. I well remember when she and Congressman Smith visited me in Juba, uh, a difficult place uh, to be, uh, and their uh, engagement there, as it has been throughout uh, the continent, has been so important. And if I might presume to speak on behalf of our African friends, I'm sure they would want me to wish her congratulations and best wishes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your remarks. I now recognize Assistant Administrator uh, Muyangwa. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Meeks, Ranking Member McCall, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the new U.S. strategy towards Sub-Saharan Africa and for your long-standing bipartisan commitment to the African continent. I arrived at USAID only a few weeks after the new strategy was launched. It comes at a crucial moment and underscores my long-held belief that the future of the United States and Africa are inextricably linked. The COVID-19 pandemic has erased years of development gains, and recent conflict has killed thousands and displaced millions more. Roughly 21 million people face starvation in the Horn of Africa, and we're also seeing the setbacks to democracy as well as the rise of malign actors. Yet the Africa that I know is also characterized by resilience, transformation, and promise. <clears throat> African nations hold significant political heft at international organization, and the African continental free trade area has created the world's fifth largest economy. And despite democratic setbacks, African citizens are demanding governments that respect the rights and dignity of all people. The U.S. strategy towards sub-Saharan Africa recognizes both challenges and opportunities facing Africa and reflects its influence in, on the international stage. Let me walk through how USAID is aligned with the strategy and highlight our way forward. First, the strategy commits to promoting fair and open societies, and USAID will continue to strengthen transparency and accountability. And we are working with civil society partners to improve the information ecosystem, including training journalists and others to stop the spread of misinformation. We will help countries address the challenges of, dig of digital infrastructure and increase gender equality and inclusion. We will also strengthen the rule of law and independent judiciaries to address corruption and safeguard individual rights. Second, the strategy recognizes the essential role that effective democracy and governance play in peace and security. So we will continue to promote democracy and good governance and collaborate with the Department of State and Defense and other international partners to advance peace and security in Africa and to support locally laid, led peace building efforts through the Global Fragility Act. Third, the strategy emphasizes the need to continue our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Through the US government vaccine effort, GlobalVax, over 229 million vaccines have been delivered to Africa. Public-private partnerships and engagement with key regional organizations like the West Africa Health Organization will continue to be essential. And when it comes to expanding economic opportunity, the US government through Prosper Africa, Power Africa, and other USAID programs will continue to strengthen trade ties and improve 
the business enabling environment. Both Prosper Africa and Power Africa have already yielded impressive results. Since Prosper Africa's launch, the US government has helped close 800 trade and investment deals across 45 African countries for an estimated value of 50 billion. Power Africa has connected more than 33 million homes and businesses to on and off grid solutions, bringing first time electricity to over 159 million people across the continent. Feed the Future has expanded to, new, to eight new African countries and continues to strengthen food systems across the continent. The Young Africa's Leaders Initiative has trained more than 22,000 youth who bring innovation, creative energy, and opportunities to civil society and economies across Africa. Fourth, the strategy recognizes the need for climate adaptation, conservation, and the restoration of ecosystems and natural resources. USAID will expand engagement in cli on climate change issues, especially adaptation, and build on our work in conservation and biodiversity. The US government recently renewed its longstanding commitment to the protection, conservation, and sustainable management of the Congo Basin. Power Africa will work closely with countries to diversify energy sources, advance the use of renewable energy, and increase the efficiency of existing systems while balancing gas to power infrastructure to help advance energy security. As you can see, USAID programs are well positioned to support the objectives in the US strategy towards Sub-Saharan Africa, yet it will not be business as usual. We must step up our engagement with African partners, diversify the breadth of countries that we work with, and engage with medium and small states to advance shared priorities including the Africa Union's Agenda 2063. I am deeply committed to USAID's mission and to advancing the US strategy towards Sub-Saharan Africa. I thank you for your continued support of USAID's work, and I welcome your questions. Uh, as I conclude, I too would like to join Assistant Secretary Molly Fee in thanking Congressmember Bass for her work to advance and support US-Africa uh, relations. And we wish you well in your new job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you both for your testimony. Um, I will now recognize members for five minutes each, pursuant to House rules. And all time yielded is for the purposes of questioning our witnesses. And I will recognize members by committee seniority alternating between Democrats and Republicans. And please note that I'm going to be somewhat strict in enforcing the five minute time limitation for questioning, uh, including with myself. So, but I'll start with by recognizing myself. Uh, let me uh, say, ask this question. You know, the strategy that the administration will redouble its efforts to ensure it has sufficient human and financial resources to plan, organize, and execute. Now, I want to make sure, so I address this question to both of you. <coughs> what deficits do you see in your staffing or funding in order to achieve the strategy's objectives? And what can we do to fill those gaps here in Congress? And also, how will the State Department and USAID ensure that, something that I've been on, that recruitment, retention, and incentives in your respective African bureaus are sufficient to meet the strategy's objectives. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I want to thank you for your attention to this issue, uh, because to realize our ambitious uh, goals, uh, we do need resources. As you know, uh, the State Department uh, has a deficit of uh, personnel uh, related to uh, decisions that were taken in the past administration. Uh, this administration asked for and received uh, funding for 500 new positions, uh, but we still uh, have a challenge in meeting, particularly at the, at the mid-level grade, uh, uh, filling our, our positions. Uh, so the administration and under Secretary Blinken's leadership is working very hard on both recruitment and retention. Uh, he's, as you know, appointed a, a diversity officer uh, to uh, address uh, that aspect of recruitment and retention. Uh, so we continue uh, to, to focus on, um, on building up uh, the, the, the State Department core so that we can uh, staff our embassies and staff uh, the Bureau. 
Uh, secondly, on resources, uh, Congress is very generous with resources for health. There's a lot of money ear earmarked for health, also education. Uh, I think we would benefit from more resources in the democracy area. Uh, that would help us address the issues of backsliding that you identified in your opening statement. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman Meeks, for that question. Uh, we have had several um, thousand positions, I think, that have been improved for the, uh, for the agency, and we're in the process of recruiting uh, for those uh, positions. That's going to take a while, but those efforts are definitely uh, underway. We are also looking at, at ensuring that as we recruit, uh, issues of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion are well reflected because that strengthens the outcomes of the work uh, that we are doing. And as the Assistant Secretary mentioned, and as you have all uh, mentioned in your uh, remarks, the question of democracy uh, and democratic backsliding on the continent is critical. And so we are looking at ways of how we can bring more uh, resources, energy, uh, to really attacking those issues uh, to arrest democratic backsliding. And so we are going to continue to look for your continued advocacy on, on, on those issues and as we work through how best uh, to arrest this democratic backsliding on the continent. So one of the things that is always, you know, does interest me because there's very, very, you know, different things that are taking place on different parts of the continent. But private sector, it seems to me when you look at the future, you know, as we talked about it, I talked about it in my opening statements and uh, Secretary Fee uh, also, it's there. And sometimes the risk factors, and I think that it has been somewhat outdated, some of the risk factors. So can you tell us what um, roles that state and USAID should and or could play and educating the private sector on the opportunities uh, that exist on the continent and, the, and as far as also the perception of risk as we get ready to get into the summit. All the African leaders I talked to, when I talked to said they want investment. They need private sector investment to help them grow their economies uh, and to make a difference. And we see others who are in there, other governments like China, who is not doing the right thing in that regards, but because of the vacuum, uh, they're able to get. Can you, can you give us uh, a response to that? Sure. I think it's clear that uh, through the discussions that have taken place at the G7, that there's a general recognition that we all need to do more, our like-minded partners on trade and investment in, in Africa. And there will be a day devoted, an Africa Business Forum, uh, during the Leader Summit, where we hope to uh, create real opportunities for American companies to engage African leaders. And we also need to continue to remind African leaders that they need to take steps uh, to create what the jargon is uh, an enabling environment to, to attract that private investment. I think the area where we see a lot of uh, engagement now that's new is the climate area. Uh, as, you, as you just learned when you were in, in Sharma Sheikh and as uh, the ranking member and I discussed, there's a lot of interest in our private sector, also in our philanthropic community, uh, to try and uh, match uh, U.S. government investment in that space. So I think that's a growth area uh, for us moving forward in the future. And lastly, I would mention the Africa free, uh, the continental free trade area. As we look towards a GOA uh, expiration or renewal in 2025, I think there might be some opportunities to link our engagement on trade preferences uh, with the building of, of that free trade area that benefits both Africans and Americans. Thank you. Thank you. My time has expired. and now yield to Mr. McCall. <clears throat> Thanks, Chairman. Uh, let me first, Secretary, just ask you about the Ethiopia <clears throat> uh, peace agreement that was signed. Can you give us an update as to whether that is um, um, effective and how is it being implemented? And as I understand it, uh, we still can't get the humanitarian aid into Tigray at the scale necessary. We are very uh, pleased with the outcome of the AU-led efforts, uh, first on November 2nd in, in Pretoria, where a cessation of hostilities agreement was agreed, um, and we have seen that take uh, effect. Uh, and then a follow-up discussions in Nairobi uh, on the implementation of the agreement on November 12th. Uh, we 
uh, are very lucky to have uh, the leadership of Kenya and South Africa and the African Union uh, to help the parties. As you know, we also contributed uh, to, to this positive outcome. Uh, aid stopped going into Tigray on August 24th when hostilities began. Uh, it is urgent that it be resumed and be unhindered and that there also be restoration of services. Those were key elements of the discussion in Nairobi on November 12th, and we already are seeing uh, movement of, uh, of, of aid into uh, Mekele and other towns in Tigray, and we expect that to increase uh, in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, that's part of the agreement. No, that's, um, uh, that's certainly uh, uh, encouraging. Yeah. If I could move to uh, kind of uh, follow up on what the chairman was talking about, you know, I, I passed the Champion American Business Through Diplomacy Act and the Prosper Africa Act. Um, <clears throat> I've already uh, expressed to you my uh, somewhat disappointment with the Development Finance Corporation's inability to do this, but these are two other um, uh, uh, pieces of legislation to get more private investment, uh, which will stabilize, you know, Africa. Um, and uh, can you tell us, uh, and I think... Uh, this will be for both of you. I, I know you mentioned uh, uh, that um, in maybe 20 different countries that the Prosper Africa Act was being uh, effective, but can you maybe give, give us a progress report on those two? No, thank you for uh, that question, um, Representative McCall. So, Prosper Africa is our primary uh, engagement tool on the economic front uh, with Africa, and we're really looking to boost uh, those efforts in terms of its engagement and contributions uh, to two-way trade uh, with the continent. In that regard, we are focusing on three priorities. Uh, the first is mobilizing U.S. institutional investments to the continent uh, in three uh, key sectors, climate, health, and sustainable infrastructure. Uh, the second is really looking for ways to fostering U.S. investments to, um, towards African innovation and entrepreneurship, particularly in the digital space, which we think is going to drive uh, Africa's digital uh, revolution. And then third is boosting uh, African exports to the United States by connecting uh, the supply chain a little bit more uh, uh, tightly there. So those are three areas that we are looking at, and we feel that if we do that, we're also going to bring in AGOA as well as the African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement. They're having a much more cohesive approach. No, Secretary? I would just add that at the upcoming Leader Summit, Ambassador Tai will host a meeting with her African counterparts uh, to talk about how we can do more in the, in the trade space. And just to affirm for you my commitment and the commitment of the administration uh, to do better in engaging the private sector uh, so that we uh, achieve the, our shared goals. Thank you. I, I know the chairman mentioned this as well, that when we meet with the ambassadors, they, they all echo that. that um, and, yeah, it's Central America, too. I mean, it's, it's, it's a common theme, but I do think in, in areas it, where stability uh, is, is key, uh, it would help stabilize um, the continent and some of these countries where if um, they become destabilized, and, and many are, uh, you're just going to breed, um, you know, crime, terrorism, um, no governance, and um, create problems for the world. So anyway, with that, I just want to say thank, thanks to the two of you, and I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Representative Brad Sherman from California for five minutes. It's uh, of course natural that uh, the Congress bemoan that uh, Karen Bass is leaving us, but she's coming to us in Los Angeles. Many of you would like to have a mayor as good as Karen Bass. Um, there are many issues in Africa, but I'm going to devote my uh, five minutes to the conflict in Ethiopia and Tigray. Uh, uh, which is the bloodiest conflict in the world uh, this uh, decade. Um, we've seen some food get in, and the, I hope that we also focus on the medicine getting in as well. Um, I want to focus on Eritrea. Uh, US, our embassy in Asmara has verified that Eritrean forces in, have been in northern Ethiopia, that they've blocked humanitarian assistance, that they've committed human rights abuses, including uh, rape and the killing of uh, children. There is no legitimate reason for Eritrean uh, uh, 
uh, uh, troops to be on uh, in, in any part of Ethiopia. Uh, I'm, of course, hopeful that they'll withdraw their troops, but they're not a party to the agreements uh, that the Assistant Secretary has cited. Um, uh, Assistant Secretary Fee, uh, will we have uh, support, will you support, additional tr sanctions on uh, uh, Eritrea if they fail to withdraw their troops, including sanctions on uh, President uh, Afwerki himself and on mining uh, in uh, er Eritrea. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Absolutely, we un uh, concur with your assessment of the negative role of Eritrea in Ethiopia. Um, it's, I think, a positive development that as part of these discussions, the issue of foreign forces is part of the agreement and uh, the withdrawal of foreign but forces. But if we need, Eritrea does yes. not withdraw, yes. Yes. You would, uh, we, yes. could, we would do those sanctions. I would point out that we could also look at uh, UN Security Council uh, efforts. Of course, Russia would veto because uh, Eritrea is one of the five countries in the world to actually vote against the uh, Ukraine uh, resolution. Uh, we could include uh, not only uh, that, but we could look at an anti-shipping campaign not aimed at ships uh, bringing food or medicine, but those bringing lu luxury goods uh, to us tomorrow. Um, for two years, the Ethiopian government has used uh, hunger as a weapon. Um, we have to have a contingency plan should the Ethiopian government fail uh, to meet its uh, conditions under these agreements. Assistant Secretary Fee, will you commit to uh, not restoring AGOA and not uh, supporting IMF, World Bank, et cetera, loans to Ethiopia until the Ethiopian government fulfills its obligations under the agreement, including humanitarian aid, protection for civilians, human rights monitoring, and a restoration of ser services, including the Internet? Yes, we've made clear to leaders of the Ethiopian government that implementation full implementation of the agreement reached in Pretoria and elaborated in Nairobi is essential to restoring uh, the partnership that we previously enjoyed. Um, we've got tens of thousands of Tigrayans, uh, ethnic Tigrayans in other parts of Ethiopia uh, that have been uh, uh, put in detention centers. Uh, the UN International Commission for Human Rights on Ethiopia in September of this year uh, said that the detentions are ongoing and that reliable information indicates that torture is occurring at these facilities. Uh, will you commit to not supporting lifting AGOA and, uh, support, and not supporting uh, international lending uh, until these ethnic Tigrayans are released? Yes, that part, this is part of our dialogue uh, with the Ethiopian government and with all parties who committed abuses during this terrible conflict. And then there is the disputed area of Western Tigray. We saw ethnic cleansing there uh, in November of 2020. The agreement calls for um, a constitutional resolution as to which regional government uh, should control Western Tigray. That could very well mean a referendum. Would that refer wouldn't any such referendum have to include only those people who live there before the ethnic cleansing, rather than uh, excluding those who have been driven from their homes and including those who moved in after, uh, after November of 2020. Congressman, I know that issue uh, is going to be discussed by the parties, uh, as you said, un under their constitution, and I don't believe the details about how they would conduct or uh, any referendum or address uh, resolution of that, um, that dispute have yet been uh, determined, so I'm not in a position to address specifically and, uh, and, and, a, and, a hypothetical scenario at this point. Gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey, who's the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, and Global Human Rights. Thank you minutes. very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, cobalt is heavily concentrated in the DRC. Most cobalt is processed in the People's Republic of China by the Chinese Communist Party. They are succeeding in creating monopoly. Uh, EVs became the largest end users of cobalt last year, 34 percent, followed by smartphones, 15 percent, and laptops and desktop uh, computers by 9 percent. At our hearing, one of our witnesses from the century said, imagine your second grader being forced to spend all day tunneling in a dangerous mine with little to no safety equipment in an area that has many known collapses with soldiers illegally intimidating and abusing minors and other civilians. 
My question is, what are we doing to stop it? Is President Chisakady uh, complicit in any way, shape, or form with this outrageous exploitation of children uh, and adults in the cobalt uh, uh, mines in DRC? Thank you, Congressman Smith, for raising this critical and tragic issue. Uh, the U.S. Department of Labor is engaged with the government of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, to try and improve uh, standards, working standards uh, in these mines. Uh, we recognize uh, that this is uh, uh, an uh, unacceptable practice, and we are working with the government to try and But we, we have had serious reports that Shitsukedi is involved with this, he is corrupt, and my question is, what is your findings on that? If you have a president who allows the Chinese to abuse your own children, uh, that is unconscionable. I know that President Chisichetti has reached out to the United States, told us that we would be a preferred partner in investment in these mines, uh, which I understand to be an implicit recognition of the of the challenges um, uh, and poor practices of Chinese investment. So we're working hard to try and take him up on that offer. But again, how do you assess the president's role? I'm not aware of, of direct presidential involvement, but let me look at that Would specifically you, and come back to you. Extraordinarily important. Yeah. You know, with the elections coming up in December of 2023 in Dira Congo, I know the Catholic and the Protestant churches have combined. Uh, are we going to work with them to make sure that that is a free, fair, and inclusive election? That's why we asked Secretary Blinken to travel to Kinshasa in August uh, to make clear our expectations that the upcoming election be free and fair and peaceful. Uh, that we uh, continue to engage with the government, and Dr. Monday could talk a little bit about USAID support for the Electoral Commission, but absolutely uh, we share those goals and are working, uh, I think, diligently to try and achieve them. And we recognize the importance and some of the challenges of the upcoming uh, election. So we are working uh, to strengthen the electoral management body and the uh, DRC to ensure that they have the capacity to hold free, fair, and transparent uh, elections. We also continue to engage with officials from the DRC on reinforcing the same message. Probably the most credible entity in DRC are the churches, the faith community, and they've done against all odds, yeoman's work in the past, will they be included, uh, both the Catholic and the Protestant churches, uh, and most importantly, will they get the funding to make it possible for them to do their work in a free and fair way? We engage with civil society. I can't speak directly to what the breakdown is in terms of faith, uh, uh, organizations' participation in, in, in that engagement. But we could definitely follow up and, and provide Extremely you with important. that I'm response. hoping to lead a delegation there next year, because sure. we've got to get this right. I mean, yeah, when after that hearing, I knew what was going on in those mines. I raised it a number of times. But until I heard uh, from two DR Congolese leaders, including a Jesuit priest, uh, it, just, it just, how could this president be complicit in this? And I believe he is. And I think that we've got to follow that up very aggressively this abuse of children. Um, can you get here? Sorry. C Congressman, I just want to add, uh, to, just to inform you, that I had the honor to meet with a delegation of religious leaders from Congo uh, to talk about these very issues. And I want to reassure you uh, that we here in Washington, as well as um, our mission in, in, in Kinshasa, are actively engaged and respect uh, very much the leadership role uh, uh, they play. Uh, and Thank you. I'm almost out of time. There's a couple of other questions, and I have many. But the strategy, again, did not include religious persecution, which is on the rise on the subcontinent, uh, was Rashid Hassan, our, your, your designee, but he's the ambassador at large for the international religious freedom. Was he involved with that process? Because surely he would have wanted, I think, a major section of this to be devoted to religious freedom. And, and lastly, again, out of time, do you, do you support and do this in written form, a criminal tribunal for Liberia? I've had hearings in the past. We've had Alan White testify. Yes, there was one in Sierra Leone. But Liberia still has a number of people who committed genocide that have not been held to account. Charles Taylor, of course, is at The Hague, you know, was convicted, but, but that was Sierra Leone's tribunal. There was a call in 2009 to establish a war crimes tribunal there. Will you support that? 
On the last issue, uh, I, I would like to come back to you. I, I'm not uh, well versed on that issue, so if it, I can take that for the record, I'll come back to you. Uh, on the issue of religious freedom, I again, I always want to thank you. It's so important that you raise this issue vocally. It's It, it really amplifies U.S. voice and impact. Um, we very much uh, consider the law uh, to be a guiding principle of how we conduct ourselves, uh, the embassy and our, all of us here in Washington, including Ambassador Hussein. So I don't want you to think that, uh, that because there's not a specific section that it is in, in, in embedded in, in every way in which we engage. I just want to affirm that for you. I would just echo the Assistant Secretary's work that the issue of religious freedom is one that's reflected in the work that uh, USA does, and so we will continue to engage on that issue in all of our um, partnerships and work with our African partners. I now recognize uh, Representative and the next mayor or the mayor-elect from Los Angeles, California, Karen Bass, currently still the chair of the House. Africa subcommittee for five minutes. Unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Uh, can we check that here? Can't hear. Hold on one second. As we deal with the technical difficulties, uh, and I don't know whether it's just Representative Bass, but while we try to work to see if not, let me try and yield five minutes to Representative Bill Keating of Massachusetts, the chair of the Europe subcommittee. Is he on? Let's see if uh, his audio works. We don't see uh, Representative <coughs> Keating. I'm also just trying to check to see the depth of the technical problems. Let me recognize Representative Dina Titus of Nevada for five minutes. If she's on. Okay. So I'm told that uh, WebEx is having issues uh, for those that are um, on virtually. So while we fix those technical di uh, difficulties, I'll yield five minutes to Representative Tom Mal Malinowski uh, from New Jersey, who's the vice chair of the full committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you to our witnesses. I, I wanted to focus on Ethiopia as well. Um, and I, I would start by saying I, I think this agreement is a potentially huge step forward. And thank you to both of you and Ambassador Hammer and Secretary Blinken and everybody who has been working very hard to try to, to bring an end to the fighting and the killing and the suffering of, of the people of, of Ethiopia. Um, we, we already went over one of the potential weaknesses, and thank you for the very clear and, and definitive answers on Eritrea's role in, in the conflict. Um, I wanted to ask as well about the humanitarian access challenges. Obviously, part of the agreement uh, includes a commitment by the government of Ethiopia to expedite um, humanitarian assistance and the restoration of services. What we've seen um, thus far is still very, very limited, though, as I'm sure you would acknowledge. Basically, two trucks to, to Mekele, which is, which is nothing. Um, and I wanted to, to start with just a broad question. What, what, what do you think the problem is? What, why is the government still 
uh, apparently um, holding up uh, aid uh, shipments, and what are we doing to overcome that? I think it, we're in a much better position than we were in the summer, uh, where aid, uh, we worked very hard, as you know, to get aid rolling, but it only went through a far province. What the government is now willing to do, and what we've already seen, trucks moving from Amhara region. Uh, that will, uh, the roads are better, um, and that will open up multiple lines. Uh, so my expectation is that we will begin to see the kind of aid deliveries that we need. Uh, part of the challenge, uh, um, bureaucratically or logistically, is that the international humanitarian agencies needed to do a security survey uh, before they began moving. Those surveys should be completed uh, 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 within the next few days, and that that will facilitate. I also wanted to call your attention to an ICRC delivery of, of medical supplies, uh, which is in addition to the truck movements. So I believe we're cautiously optimistic uh, that we will see the results that need to happen. Okay. Well, there's a, a, a comment by the, the lead uh, government negotiate, uh, negotiator, Red One Hussein, that, that struck me as concerning. He said, quote, once the government controls the airports, the navigation system, and airspace fully, then we will allow aid to flow both on the ground and in the air. What, what's going on there? Does that strike you as an appropriate condition to place on the free flow of um, food and medicine? I also saw those comments. What's important is that the uh, agreement, the, the elaboration of the agreement that was negotiated in Nairobi has no such reservations. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's our expectation that they will, the government will comply with those, uh, okay. with that agreement. Um, and, and finally, I want to ask you about an aspect of this that we don't talk about often enough. Um, and that is the role that um, some of our leading American companies have played in creating this environment in Ethiopia and in many other countries around the world um, in which people who live together um, now um, hate each other with a passion that, um, that has, in this case, led to horrific acts of violence. I'm talking obviously about Facebook and Google that, that created these platforms, um, which they try to moderate in the United States, but moderate far less in countries uh, where people speak languages that Silicon Valley does not speak. Um, I'm just wondering, and I'm sure you share my assessment on this, uh, to what extent is the, the, the department, the administration engaging with leadership of these companies um, to pressure them to dedicate the vastly greater resources that are needed to ensure that um, incitement of violence, incitement of genocide um, by um, armed actors uh, and, and just regular people in countries like Ethiopia uh, is, is actually dealt with. I appreciate you raising this concern. I don't think I have a good answer. We have had episodic engagement with the leadership of those companies. Uh, we haven't achieved the results uh, we would like to see. I would observe um, that uh, in the specific case of Ethiopia, we have separately attempted to engage with the diaspora, uh, which itself has played a role in accelerating this rhetoric. So sort of having diplomatic engagement to compensate for the deficiencies in the, in the social media space. I would also observe that I think this is a problem along the, uh, across the continent. Uh, we have a lot of uh, fragile societies uh, that coexist uneasily uh, in social media, um, and as well, Russian propaganda, for example, by the Wagner Group, uh, can be very disruptive and divisive. And I don't know, it's a problem, frankly, in our own society, as you know well, and I think it's an area where we uh, can work together. We're lucky to have Nate Fick now at the State Department, who's looking at cyber and digital policy, uh, and I I think uh, there's hope that we can try and do more in this space. Thank you. My time's up. The gentleman's time has expired. Now, I think we're trying to do a mic check on the virtual. So <clears throat> let's uh, see what we have there. Mic check. Five, four, three, two, one. 
Can we do the mic check? Trying again. Five, four, three, two, one. We don't hear you. I hear it vaguely five, four, three, two, one, but we can't hear you clearly or loudly. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We now hear you. So I now we'll move forward to our next uh, member, and that's Representative Scott Perry of Pennsylvania. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to start out by acknowledging the service of my colleague on the other side of the aisle from New Jersey, Mr. Malinowski. Um, I have found him to be a engaged, um, informed, and thoughtful and worthy adversary uh, of mine. We, we haven't agreed on a lot, but, uh, but he's been here to serve, and I just wanted to say that that should be acknowledged and appreciated. Thank you so much, seriously. Um, ladies, Director, Secretary, thanks for being here. It, would you acknowledge, both of you, that Congolese child labor and the cobalt mines is, is occurring. Is that something that we can agree on? That yes. Okay. Sounds like it's a yes. Um, would you would you characterize? I, I don't know where you are on this, but would you characterize yourself as generally for colonialism or generally against colonialism? And I would describe it as the exploitation of one nation's resources by another nation's. I think I can speak for my colleague that we would both be opposed. Thank you. Okay. So it wouldn't be, Director, I think you mentioned disinformation. It wouldn't be disinformation to say that the Chinese are practicing colonialist activities in, in Africa, and particularly in the Congo, in the, in the cobalt mines, and in particular with the child labor practices that are occurring there. That wouldn't be disinformation, would it? No, sir. No, I, I didn't think so. Would you also acknowledge that, um, that there is slave labor incorporated, and I know this is out of your sphere of, of direct work, but in uh, East Turkestan, Xinjiang province in China regarding the construction of batteries and related items to electric vehicles and electronics and, and uh, essentially the net zero agenda? Slave labor. As you mentioned, I wouldn't feel comfortable speaking outside of Africa. Uh, I, I, I don't have the, 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 the data or the knowledge. Director? Nor do I. Okay, so neither one of you have ever heard about these claims or unaware. Are you aware and just not sure or? Uh, obviously, sir, we're, we're aware as hopefully okay. informed foreign affairs professionals. I just want to get, I just want to it, get where yeah, you. Thank you. So. Um, what autonomy should, do you believe that Africa should have in deciding how it produces and distributes energy and, and where does the United States tax dollar play a factor in that? What autonomy should African nations have in choosing? As the central tenet of the strategy is to treat Africans as partners, uh, we believe they should have autonomy uh, uh, and that they do have autonomy. Of course, as the United States seeking to advance our interest, we will use all the tools available to us uh, to uh, promote our, our views and interests in our engagement with African nations. So do you, do you think that the United States should promote its views on religion, on the people of Africa? It's U.S. law, sir, for us to promote religious freedom. Okay, but what about religious dogma? I understand religious freedom, and we can get into a long discussion about promoting religious freedom as it's juxtaposed what actually happens in the law. But generally speaking, do you think the United States should promote the, the United States government through United States tax dollars should promote the, the belief in Christianity, so to speak, or Judaism or anything else? Uh, Congressman, my, my conduct and the conduct of our team is guided by our Constitution and by our law. So what does that mean? Do you believe in the promotion of that or not? 
I believe in the promotion of religious freedom, but not in, of any particular dogma. Okay, yeah, not in any particular dogma, which I, I would agree with you. So why then do you think it's appropriate for the United States to impose on Africa the zero carbon or the net zero agenda on a population that is striving and struggling to get out of poverty, knowing, knowing that it is also the imposition of Chinese colonialism tied to child labor, slave labor, at a minimum, and also at, a, at an increased cost to some of the people, to people who can least afford it on the planet. Why is that appropriate? The verb impose is perhaps not uh, the, an accurate reflection of policy. I, I understand our policy to be to encourage uh, a zero carbon uh, uh, results, but to also recognize the challenges that Africa is uh, facing right now, just as you've identified, and to support adaptation and to support uh, transition. So I think we recognize the complexity of the situation and uh, we also recognize that the Russian war in Ukraine has created uh, additional complications on the, on the global energy agenda, and we need to work through those uh, complications. Chairman's time has expired. Thank the Chair. I now recognize Representative Dina Titus of Nevada for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to follow up on some of the points that were made earlier about the Ethiopian conflict and ask this to Assistant Secretary Fee. Now that the conflict has ended, and we hope that continues, I wonder what actions the administration has taken to support unfeathered access to the Tigray region so that they can conduct um, uh, oh, investigations into potential war crimes, human rights violations, crimes against humanity. We've heard that there, that access has been hindered from a number of different sources. I wonder if you could enlighten us more on that. <clears throat> Representative Titus, thank you for raising that important issue. In conversations uh, that the Secretary, uh, Ambassador Hammer, and I have had uh, with Ethiopian government and TPLF representatives about resolving this conflict, we have raised uh, the importance of addressing uh, accountability, uh, the hu grave human rights violations that have occurred during this conflict, and the importance of having independent monitors, chiefly those from the UN, uh, uh, be able to enter Tigray and other areas uh, of Ethiopia where uh, we understand abuses have taken place. So I wanna reassure you that in, in, in recent days, uh, in every conversation we've had uh, about um, addressing this uh, conflict, we have explained the importance to the United States uh, of, of significant action to address uh, the human rights violations that took place. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. And I know some of my constituents who have been very concerned about that will also. Maybe you could keep us kind of posted on some of the findings that y'all uh, have as you pursue this. Uh, now I'd like to ask the director. We we're talking about uh, Prosper Africa and how that's going to be a key player as we enhance our economic relations between the U.S. and, and Africa. I wonder if you could explain how Prosper Africa is working to connect building on public-private relationships in order to provide more opportunities for uh, women-owned businesses or micro-industries. Thank you for that um, question, Congress Member. So Prosper Africa, uh, through uh, a number of initiatives, focuses on, uh, on, on women. There's an, actually a standalone uh, initiative that we have that focuses on women businesses and trying to encourage them in the uh, trade uh, sphere. So we will continue to push on that end uh, to uh, expand that program and have it take hold both within Prosper Africa itself, but also within our support for um, AGOA and the African Continental Free Trade Area work that we're doing. How do you get the word out that this is available for people to take advantage of or to use to start up businesses for women? or? Uh, promote their products so that we will become a better market for those companies in Africa? Uh, Prosper Africa has actually established a digital platform. Uh, its name escapes me now, where 
businesses on, on both ends uh, can tap onto this digital platform to get all the information that they need about doing business uh, with each other. And we have seen uh, tremendous uh, access to that platform, uh, trying to find out what the opportunities are, uh, trying to find out how the U.S. government can support uh, those who would like to engage uh, in Africa. I can definitely uh, follow up on that and get you the information that, that you need. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. General Lady yields back. I now recognize... Oh, I now recognize uh, Representative Darrell Issa of California for five minutes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I want to continue on on the uh, Prosper Africa initiative. Uh, uh, you know, Sec Secretary Pompeo uh, put a lot of time and effort into getting it started. But uh, today, now two additional years past the changing of the administration, one of my questions is, what can you point to uh, as specifics of accomplishment? In other words, usually there's at least anecdotal stories and I haven't heard any of them today. Thank you for that uh, question, Representative Issa. Let me just um, point to some of the accomplishments that we've had under Prosper uh, Africa, if you just give me a second. Sorry. Well, you're, well, you're doing that. Uh, I'm going to ask a follow-up okay. question, realizing we're dealing primarily with Africa. Is this, in fact, a program that is equally portable and should be uh, equally uh, distributed throughout similar countries beyond uh, sub-Saharan Africa? Maybe that's a, a good question while we're waiting for specific uh, accomplishments. Can I go on? Sure. So let me just very quickly speak to some of the uh, accomplishments. Please. Since uh, its establishment, we have uh, mobilized $1.5 billion of investment in climate, health, and sustainable uh, infrastructure, and also established teams of investment advisors at both USAID and DFC who work with embassy deal teams to advance trade and investment transactions. We are working with uh, dedicated Prosper Africa funding to mobilize exports into, uh, into the trade space by expanding our resourcing operations. And so for every $1 of US government funding, we are leveraging at least $15 in private sector uh, investment. We recently took a group of US pension funds from Chicago, Hartford, and Philadelphia to Africa to break down the perceptions of risk, therefore bridging this perception of uh, the risk in Africa being too high. Often what we find is that when people actually get on the ground, they get to see that that risk perception is not uniform across the continent and that there are areas where they could actually uh, invest. And as a result, they invested 85 million in a Pan-African fund along a South African pension fund. And this is going to provide uh, financing to entrepreneurs and small businesses across West Africa. So those are just some of the accomplishments that we've had that we are okay. looking so, to build on. So the $85 million uh, fund has not been distributed yet, but it's, it's in process. Is that your statement? I understand so, but I can confirm that and get back to your office. Okay, and I appreciate your answer, and, and I know that it, it, you were tempted to be fully responsive. What I was looking for were those examples where an implementation has led to a change in uh, a community or individual entrepreneurs and so on. Uh, what I heard is what we usually have, we do in government. We talked about how many people we employed and how much money we spent. So if you don't mind, uh, for the record, if you would follow up with examples of implementation that have led to uh, economic differences, in other words, the effect of the money we spent rather than uh, the effort we've made to spend it and to uh, educate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm going to use my remaining time to just make a, a comment. Uh, I know this is an important uh, hearing and with my colleague and longtime friend, uh, Karen Bass, 
uh, moving on to a, another large job in her career. Um, I, I want to take a moment to thank her for the hard work and the many years that she uh, has been a leader on this committee. I, uh, I know she'll be missed and uh, by all of us on both sides of the aisle. And so, uh, you know, I, we often get, we often talk about what we don't agree on, and I could certainly bring up a few uh, here today, but it'd be inappropriate when, I, when in fact, uh, Karen, you've worked so hard on what we do agree on, and uh, I wanna thank you for your service. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my last 12 seconds. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Castro of Texas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And also thank you to Karen for all of her work on the Africa subcommittee over the years. Incredible work. Uh, I'll jump right in. Uh, in one month, the United States is hosting the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit here in Washington. Uh, this, of course, is an important opportunity to, to demonstrate U.S. leadership in the region. Uh, but I believe there should be more visibility on what we hope to substantively accomplish at the summit. And so my question for Assistant Secretary Fee is what concrete deliverables can we expect from this summit? Thank you for your question. I view this uh, summit as an opportunity to consolidate the great work that's already underway. You know, thanks to Congress, we have doubled our uh, normal food security investment of about 400 million. Uh, to about 800 million this year to help Africans deal with the consequences of the war in Ukraine. Uh, likewise, under uh, the president and the secretary's leadership, uh, we have also uh, massively increased our investment in health uh, to help Africans not only deal with the COVID pandemic and the economic impact, uh, but to help uh, develop a health security to deal with the next uh, pandemic that's coming. And you see a lot of uh, news coming out of Sharma Sheikh uh, where we've increased our engagement uh, to help uh, with managing climate change. So a lot of what we will be doing in the summit is, is sort of consolidating uh, what great work and partnership is already underway, having a conversation about what else is needed, and, um, and using the summit to catapult the relationship forward. I expect there to be serious discussion about uh, increasing the African role in the multilateral system, whether the G20, uh, the Security Council, or reforms to uh, multilateral banking institutions so that they have the financing and investment that we've talked about. Um, and it will be important for uh, leaders to meet not only President Biden, but the rest of the cabinet. Uh, and, and I mentioned earlier the Africa Business Forum, uh, as well as related side events where we're really making an effort to expose uh, African leaders to American companies. So those are the types of activities that we expect to come out of the summit. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your great work. Um, and you know, Congress has played a leading role in deepening our engagement with Africa, such as through the African Growth and Opportunity Act and the Electrify Africa, Africa Act of 2015. Uh, what legislative efforts will support the anticipated summit outcomes? Uh, and then also, you know, I'd heard that African countries have not received their formal invitations to the summit. What's the timeline for extending those invitations for getting them out? On the latter question first, I, I think that is a, an erroneous report. We have formally invited the delegations uh, and we're looking forward to receiving confirmation this week of who's coming. They also have received a draft program uh, with speaking roles and we're engaged both with our embassies in Africa and here in Washington with the, with the diplomatic corps. Um, Ambassador Tai will be hosting a meeting of her counterparts to discuss the future of AGOA. Uh, it's my belief that there is um, a win-win uh, uh, scenario uh, for us with AGOA and uh, for Africans with a continental free trade area. And I'm hopeful that uh, in that discussion, uh, we can talk about how we can help both, uh, both populations uh, do better uh, with trade and investment and jobs. Uh, so I, those are some of the types of activities that will also be part of this uh, multi-day extravaganza. Great. Well, uh, you know, I'm glad that the formal limitations have been extended and that you're, you're going to hear back soon from who's attending because, you know, I've seen and others have seen these summits come together at the last minute uh, and we end up not getting out of the summit everything that we potentially could. Uh, so I'm, I'm very glad that uh, the State Department is on top of it. It's also good to see including African countries in multilateral forums 
You know, I've been disappointed that they've not been as vested at the UN on Ukraine issues, for example. And we have to be more inclusive. We should be more inclusive of the people of Africa, the people of Latin America, and places in the world that the US Congress, for example, uh, doesn't often pay as much attention to uh, as Europe or other places. So thank you for all of your work. And uh, I look forward to uh, being helpful you know, in helping to deliver legislatively whatever we agreed to at the summer. I yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Representative Burchett of Tennessee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your friendship. You're, you're an excellent legislator and an excellent receiver, I will say, on the congressional football team. So, um, Ms. Fee, uh, could you talk to me a little bit about China's growing influence in Africa um, how, and how, in fact, that's undermining our relationship across the continent? I'm always concerned about the Belt and Road Initiative and the way they just mistreat folks. And I wonder if you could elaborate on some of that, please, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's a challenge that we're alert, alert to and, and trying to address. Uh, you know, there are some areas where we can cooperate with China, particularly uh, in the environment, but there are many more areas uh, where we need to compete uh, and in some instances contest. We have a different model than the Chinese, as you know. Uh, we invest in human capital and development and in systems and in institutions. Sometimes uh, some of that investment is less obviously visible. Uh, the Chinese tend to do uh, 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 bright and shiny uh, objects. Some of the investment in infrastructure has been helpful. Uh, other uh, uh, practices uh, have resulted in substandard uh, infrastructure and substandard labor practices. Uh, so we are working to develop alternatives for our African partners uh, so that they are able to choose uh, U.S. engagement. And we are also working with the G7 and the EU uh, to expand uh, the opportunities for Africans uh, to move away from the Chinese model. Thank you. I, I would hope at some point we would um, um, look into creating entrepreneurs in Africa and not just creating sweatshops. You know, I, I'm, I, I kind of weird out on bamboo all the time. I make bamboo skateboards at home. It's cheaper than a psychiatrist. So it uh, kind of gets my mind off things. But I noticed that there, in some areas they um, use what's called iron bamboo and make bicycles, and then they export them to America, and they sell them for thousands of dollars, things like that. I would hope we'd kind of look outside the, you know, they're not going to create a new computer out in the middle of the desert somewhere, but dadgummit, they could do some things I think that would help, and I would hope that we would look look to some of those. I have another question though. You brought up environment. It's not in my notes, but I'm, I've been studying this for quite some time is the, the reclaiming of some of these deserts that are really just ravaging these countries um, due to, uh, they, don't have, they don't have education, they don't have fuel, they have to burn the trees. There's not anything left, nothing to hold the topsoil down. The UN a few years ago listed not, um, they, uh, they listed several things that, that were, um, uh, of great concern, and their number one concern at one time to humanity was the depletion of topsoil, oddly enough. And uh, I'm wondering, are you all doing anything to work with them? I know the Chinese are, and that scares the daylights out of me, because the Chinese aren't doing it because they love the people of Africa. They want to control more and, um, and get more rare uh, metals. And I wonder, are you all doing anything in that realm of reclaiming deserts and some of those really uh, deprived areas. That's such an important issue, uh, but it's very specific. So I, I would like to look into uh, the blizzard of environmental project finance that has just been announced uh, as part of Sharma Sheikh and come back to you. I would offer that uh, both uh, important issues you've highlighted, entrepreneur uh, and helping uh, Africans deal with the um, terrible impacts of climate change, I think are united and we're trying to see how we can uh, support entrepreneurs in this space. But if it's okay, I'll come back to you on the specific issue of, of, uh, of uh, the soil um, in the Sahara. I wish you really would. I don't, don't just check a box. I'm, unless the Lord or somebody else takes me out, I'm gonna be here for two more years. So I would expect to hear from y'all hopefully in the new year. That'd be all right. Ma'am, did you wanna add to that, please? Sure. 
We at USAID have some work going on in that area, particularly in the, in the, in the Sahel. I'm not sure as to the scale and scope, but I would say that given developments in that region, it's probably work that we would uh, appreciate some advocacy in terms of scaling up that work. Okay, I would, and I'd also, I, I like USAID. Sometimes I don't like some of the stuff USAID does. I think you all have a PR problem. And with the, uh, just like the desert, changing sands, there are changing sands in Washington. And if you all could work some on your PR and letting us know exactly the good things you all were doing, I would really appreciate that, ma'am, because I would like to be in your corner on a lot of issues. Thank you all, and I yield back the remainder of my two seconds, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and uh, I'm, I've been wondering whether Dag Gamut is an allowable word in the Dad Gummit, D A D G U M M I T. I'm going to allow it. I'm okay, going to allow thank it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It was just a thought if, that if I you, had. If you didn't, it would knock out about half my vocabulary. <laughs> thank you, brother. Um, and with that, um, we are going to recess the committee for just for a short period of time um, so that we can observe interesting events on the floor of the House uh, and hopefully come back as, uh, as soon as possible. So if I could ask the witnesses to. to hang out for a bit, that would be great. Thank you so much. Oh, yes, I have to do this.
All right, let's call the committee back into session. Uh, and uh, we will begin or resume with Representative Sarah Jacobs of California for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much to our witnesses. And I'll echo the comments of my colleagues. We are going to miss the leadership of Congresswoman Bass. Uh, and I am uh, I know that Los Angeles is very lucky. And I'm very lucky that we're only two hours away in San Diego. Um, so uh, my first question is for you, Assistant Secretary Fee. I was so glad to see in the administration's Africa strategy a recognition that our counterterrorism approach over the past three decades has come up short and that there are strong link linkages between exclusionary governance, human rights abuses, and corruption with insecurity. Um, just the other day, uh, Assistant Administrator Jenkins from USAID's CPS Bureau noted that 71% of violent extremists escalated to violence because they or a close family member experienced violence personally from the state. So my question is, how will this acknowledgement of, uh, of the needs to change our counterterrorism approach actually change our approach? In other words, as the lead on US diplomacy in Africa, how will you use your position to incentivize needed reform in governance and human rights so that governments hear the signal loud and clear that our priority is actually those things and not if they just help us a little on counterterrorism, we'll turn a blind eye to everything else. Thank you very much for your leadership on this issue and uh, for your focus on the linkages uh, between good governance um, and, and bad security. Uh, and I think we all agree, for example, what we're seeing in the Sahel uh, is uh, uh, pr problems in governance that lead to vulnerabilities that the terrorists exploit. We have two big tools at our hand, at our disposable. One is our voice, uh, how we engage uh, with leaders. And I want to reassure you that uh, we are emphasizing the importance of these issues in our discussions with governments, as well as other aspects of a, a society uh, to help uh, increase um, uh, their understanding that it's a priority for our funding and our engagement. Uh, we're also looking at our resourcing um, and the Global Fragility Act, I think, will be the best tool that's available to us. And we're also a third leg, um, which I'd like to take the time to brief you on later, if I can, is we've done a lot of uh, review and research of programs, particularly the Trans-Sahel Counterterrorism Partnership, what worked, what hasn't, so that we can guide our, uh, our interventions in the future. And lastly, I would say one of the exciting aspects to me of the GFA is the focus on metrics and constant evaluation uh, so that we hold ourselves accountable to doing better and changing the way we do things. Thank you, and I will look forward to that briefing. Um, on, on the similar, on the same topic, you know, I think nowhere is more clear that our military at first approach has failed than Somalia. Um, and while there have been recent tactical gains in central and southern Somalia against Al Shabaab, the absence of effective governance has prevented long-term progress. Deep divisions among federal leaders, etc. Um, so, given that reconciliation among these entities is vital to moving forward, what concrete actions is the Biden administration taking to support efforts on reconciliation, uh, which pr the president, President Hassan Sheikh, has identified as a priority? And does the State Department have a plan to help the federal government of Somalia see reconciliation through a long-term effort? Absolutely, we're working in support of the president's leadership um, to for the federal government to engage in a sustained and systemic way with the member states uh, so that they can achieve the kind of political reforms you've identified. You'll recall that Under Secretary Newland uh, traveled to Somalia uh, this summer. Uh, President Hassan Sheikh uh, came to Washington in September and met, among others, with Secretary Blinken. Uh, and a key message in those engagements is the need for him to sustain and expand uh, that political reconciliation. Thank you. Um, uh, Assistant Administrator Mayungwa, my next question's for you. Um, I was pleased by uh, Administrator Power's prioritization of locally-led development at USAID. I think it's particularly relevant for Africa, where the international community's approach has historically not been locally-led. Uh, unfortunately, most development in Africa has too often been led by US-based development contractors. Um, so I wanted to ask about the recently announced Africa Localization Initiative to direct more funding to local organizations. Can you speak to any details about the plan and implementation of this announcement and how we can work together to ensure its success. No, thank you very much for uh, that question. Uh, we agree fully with you about the importance of localization to sustainable development, particularly on the, on the continent. Uh, fortunately, we do have um, a solid foundation on which to build on with our localization efforts since uh, a number of previous administrations over USAID have focused on that. So we're 
continuing to build on, on, on that foundation. Right now, the Africa Bureau is uh, designing an Africa localization uh, initiative to fit within the broader USAID uh, localization effort. And we are looking at a handful of countries where we're gonna look at how we can enhance um, our localization efforts there and then come back and uh, scale up uh, to other missions. And we anticipate that we'll be able to announce additional details about this uh, initiative in, uh, but before the end of the year, and so we'll be happy to re-engage at that point. I will look forward to those details. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Tenney of New York for five minutes. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, just want to say thank you to the witnesses. And my first question is going to be for Assistant Secretary Fee. Uh, on October 18th, the State Department publicly acknowledged that Iran transferred Mohajer 6 uh, unmanned aerial uh, vehicles to Ethiopia last summer. This is a direct violation of UN Security Council Resolution 2231. I wanted to know if you could tell me if the administration has used access or the authorities provided under its executive order 13949 in Iran uh, relating to Iran or related entities or people for its role in providing these drones to Ethiopia, uh, which permits the broad application of sanctions against individuals who have engaged or attempted to engage in manufacture, acquisition, possession, development, transport, transfer, or use of any of these military items uh, to and from Iran. Has the administration used these authorities uh, against these entities or people for all of those above, any or all of those above reasons, uh, in their role in procuring those drones from Iran? Thank you for highlighting uh, that troublesome action. Uh, my understanding is that we have taken uh, direct action, uh, sanctions action. Um, I would want to check on the particular authorities that were used and get back to you. So do you, you, you believe there has been some sanctions yes. done? Yes. Can, can we... Just want to be sure, for the record, we can get those uh, under the under the chairman's rule. Yes. Thank you. Um, then, so let me just follow up with this. Uh, we've been very clear about the, the fact that these drones are this are these Mahajir drones uh, to Russia in violation of UN Security Council Treaty 2231. Is there a reason why we haven't taken a similar public stance against actions by Ethiopia, which presumably are also a violation under um, the UN Security Council Resolution 2231? To, to ensure that I'm perfectly correct, I'd like to uh, follow up on that question. Okay, if that's thank right. you. So I would just ask: Is uh, is are we doesn't limiting our criticism of the Iranian Mohajir transfer to Europe uh, in context undermine the legitimacy of our position when it comes to these uh, UAVs and and under the UN Resolution 2231, we're inconsistent in dealing with these two different entities. We've spoken repeatedly and directly, mm -hmm. and directly about uh, the danger uh, and the acceleration of the conflict that has been caused by uh, external parties providing weapons. Uh, so it's been part of our public diplomacy, and I will follow up on the specifics of Thank the, you. Uh, what kind of sanctions really uh, do you envision would happen uh, under the Biden administration? What, what are we going to be doing? What would you think would be appropriate in, in this situation here? With regard to the to, action to, by Iran? Taking action on this, the transfer of these uh, unmanned aerial vehicles uh, of this nature from Iran to Ethiopia and also in the case of Russia. I, I don't mean to dodge the question, mm -hmm. but I would prefer to um, consult with our authorities on, on the sanctions. I think they would have the best answer for that, and I will follow up. Are you aware of any of this happening, though, of this these actually happening, or are you just not sure of the exact nature of them happening? The reaction or the conduct? The conduct. No, absolutely, we're, we're aware of the conduct. Is it that you don't have the specifics on, on what the sanctions would be, or you know the contact occurred, you just don't know what the administration has done. Is that what you're explaining it's to me? The, it's the authorities, I'm not sure which were used, so that I would prefer to be accurate in my response. Okay, but, there were, were, but the authorities, they have done something, sanctions have been Im implicated, you just don't know the exact nature of them. I, I, I would like to take that back and conf confirm that I'm giving you the best answer. Okay, so basically you don't, you're not sure if any sanctions have been taken, have ta been done. I know that there have been sanctions taken against uh, Iranian actions um, uh, with regard to transfers, weapons transfers, but I don't know the specifics. Okay, so, but, but you know that it was done. I, 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 re I really am not in a good position to answer. I need to come back to you. Okay, I guess my, my question, so you did confirm, we know that they were, the transfers were done, sanctions were it initiated using the authorities. We just need to get the specifics on that. Can I, can I just clarify that? 
I, I, I really am not confident in, 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 the, in the arrangements, so I, I will come back to you if that's okay. right. Can we, provide, can we get that within the five days as required by the Absolutely. Committee? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Representative Allred of Texas for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'm glad to see our witnesses here. I'll say this at the um, uh, encouragement of Chairman Meeks. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, be a part of a presidential delegation at the inauguration of the new Kenyan president uh, with our two distinguished uh, guests uh, this afternoon. Um, and, you know, it was inspiring uh, to see a, a country that had experienced difficult and violent transitions or lack thereof or challenges to uh, election results have and go through an election in which uh, the results were accepted. We met people who, I think we, we can all agree, you know, broadly understood what happened in the election. They had a lot of transparency around it. Um, they had, a, I think, a, an inspiring inauguration in which, you know, their handing over of the um, instruments of power are very literal. Uh, and uh, I think it was also important that there were a lot of other African leaders there uh, who could learn from uh, Kenyan's example. And, you know, obviously as an American uh, and as someone who was a voting rights lawyer before I came to Congress, uh, I, I found that to be inspiring, but also um, even an example for us, uh, given that we did not have a peaceful transfer of power for the first time in our history after our last presidential election. And, you know, Africa, as you've said in your testimonies, uh, is a continent of opportunity, of young folks, of uh, entrepreneurs, of, of you know, women taking on enormous leadership roles, of emerging countries uh, that we need to support and encourage the positive trends and, and help them combat some of the things that are, that are challenging them. And so, um, you know, uh, Dr. Miangwa, uh, I'll say uh, Ms. Fee, um, what do you see Kenya's role in terms of being uh, the anchor of our regional strategy? Uh, what impact do you think we've already seen from the, the change in administration there? Uh, and, and how has that uh, impacted uh, the Biden administration's approach uh, here with, in, in terms of uh, your Sub-Saharan Africa overall strategy? Thanks, Congressman, and let me say uh, it was a terrific to have you on that trip uh, uh, for many reasons, but including to demonstrate congressional interest in and support for Africa. Uh, President Ruto, uh, as you recall in his inaugural speech, asked President Kenyatta, uh, whom he succeeded, uh, to take on regional uh, leadership roles, which he has done very effectively. He played a critical role in helping uh, the Ethiopians uh, reach a cessation of hostilities uh, and begin to take additional steps that are required to resolve that conflict. He's also been actively involved in the Eastern DRC, uh, trying to stop uh, the conflict that is uh, disrupting so many lives there. Uh, and they're working together well. President Ruto himself, when he was in Sharm el-Sheikh, hosted a, a meeting of leaders uh, to try and address the conflict in Eastern DRC. So we see good coordination between the incumbent and his predecessor. Um, we continue to work closely with Kenya uh, in the fight against al-Shabaab. Uh, and we're also working, uh, and I will let Dr. Monday speak about this more, uh, to help uh, Kenya and other countries in the Horn deal with this historic uh, four-year drought. Uh, Ambassador Whitman is uh, mobilizing U.S. trade and investment, uh, trying to help uh, the Kenyan economy continue to flourish. Uh, and we're working uh, very closely on food security matters uh, uh, because Kenya, like many African countries, is suffering from the consequences of the Russian war. So all in all, we have a robust, productive uh, partnership, and we um, are immensely appreciative of Kenya's leadership in the region. Thank you. I don't want to have anything to add. No, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to travel with you to Kenya and uh, just echoing the Assistant Secretary's words about how important your presence there was uh, to show support uh, for the Kenyan people as they made this uh, very, very important transition. 
So we are working uh, with Kenya in a, in a number of ways to add on to what the Assistant Secretary said. Uh, part of it is uh, continuing to work with Kenya on strengthening uh, governance, strengthening um, devolution, strengthening uh, citizen participation in the economy. We're working, and governance, uh, working with Kenya on um, food security issues. Uh, we know there's a looming uh, drought uh, in the Horn of Africa, and uh, Kenya has about 4.5 million people who are under threat for severe food uh, insecurity in 2023 if uh, the long rains do not come. So we're working with Kenya on a number uh, of fronts, and they will continue to be an important partner for us. Well, thank you both for your service. It was uh, a pleasure to travel with you, and it was an honor to be there on, on behalf of uh, the United States. And it, it was an inspiring trip, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that um, our cooperation is continuing. And I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chair now recognizes Representative Mast of Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Ms. Fee, everybody, thank you for your testimonies today. Appreciate that. Uh, I want to speak to you a little bit about uh, our funding, United Nations, if we're getting our money's worth, uh, how you see leveraging the support that we give to Africa as a whole. Uh, I want to say it's somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of the United Nations uh, delegation is made up of African countries. Uh, we provide somewhere $8 billion plus dollars a year uh, to African nations. Do you think that we're leveraging that appropriately in terms of getting them to support United States priorities within the United Nations, or where do you think that is lacking? I, as in all things, uh, the record is a bit mixed. Uh, generally speaking, in the Security Council, the current African members have voted in support of the United States. Uh, you know, there are many ways in which we engage uh, in the United Nations system. African uh, leaders overwhelmingly supported the U.S. candidate for that obscure uh, U.N. agency, the International Telecommunications Union, which will have an outsized impact on Internet governance globally. Uh, so that was a very positive outcome. Uh, we work very hard to have African support in the U.N. Human Rights Council. Uh, and in fact, uh, African support was critical to getting a commission uh, for the uh, atrocities that have taken place in Ethiopia uh, during the recent conflict. Uh, we do not always succeed in getting the high numbers that we would like uh, in terms of our policy goals, um, whether they particularly regard to Russia or China. Um, however, on many of the uh, resolutions related to Ukraine, uh, Africans um, provided majority support. Uh, so I, we also, as you know, contribute very much to Africa through the um, international humanitarian organizations such as the World Health Organization, the FAO, WFP, and we're also a big supporter for peacekeeping missions on the continent. Uh, so we're engaged both externally uh, providing support through the UN system to Africa uh, and encouraging the African voice to uh, support U.S. priorities uh, at different voting bodies in the system. What would you put the total number of U.S. aid to Africa at when you add up all of those items? I would have to come back to you on that I, to make sure that I gave you a, a, a reasonable range. But it's significant, if that's your point. If you, if you consider, for example, <coughs> as you said, that we give about 28 percent in support of each peacekeeping mission, as well as each political mission in Africa, um, uh, we, our contribution is significant. Where do you think that's paid off the most? And where do you think, uh, I'll let you cough a minute, I take a drink if you need. Um, where do you think that's paying off the most, where we're getting our money's worth? And uh, where do you think they're lagging behind? Who do you think is in jeopardy of saying, yeah, we don't think that you're a good use of US taxpayer dollars to support? I don't view it in strictly transactional terms. Uh, I, I think it's in our... Why not? Um, uh, because I believe the uh, United States' role as a leader um, and as a model uh, is more complex. And, and I, I find it's often effective as we, if we work in partnership. Um, so there are some instances where being transactional is appropriate, uh, but not in all instances. Okay. But who would you say is not pulling their weight. You, you mean in Africa? Yes. Uh, I would say Eritrea is a good example. Eritrea votes uh, universally with Russia. That you would like us to, you know, 
look at in a more pinpointed way as members of the Foreign Affairs Committee? What would be helpful to you that we looked at in a more pinpointed way? Eritrea. With, with regard to the UN system? Correct. I think we're collectively facing a challenge in certain uh, peacekeeping missions in Africa. I would cite the Central African Republic and Mali as good examples where the Wagner Group is present. So you have a, a member of the P5 actively undermining a Security Council authorized peacekeeping mission. Uh, the president, as you saw in September, highlighted the importance of revitalizing the UN Charter principles of uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty. Uh, the actions of Wagner Group uh, undermine those and other principles. Uh, so that's a challenge we're facing collectively. Pause you very quickly, uh, because the idea of transactional is important. And while I have a few more seconds just to ask you, where do you think Russia and China are doing it successfully? Where, where do they have an advantage with some of those nations that they are getting a better transaction than the United States of America? I don't think they universally succeed. They certainly try, um, uh, and they don't succeed in part because they present it in transactional terms. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, and uh, I would just maybe add, add briefly that remember that aid, the aid we provide is mostly for people, not for governments. And, and so to the extent we're going to be transactional, it would be the aid to the governments, not the vast majority of the aid that USAID provides, which is to help save lives. Um, I will now uh, recognize Representative Muser of Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much to our witnesses, uh, Secretary, Director. So, um, economic growth and uh, maximizing of a country's natural resources usually leads to improved economies and quality of life. 13% um, of the world's natural gas is in the continent of Africa, 7% of the oil reserves, uh, with Nigeria uh, being the largest of all. Africa, for instance, has 620 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Marcella Shale, which is primarily in Pennsylvania, has 410, uh, so quite a bit less, uh, almost 50% less. 43% uh, of the, meanwhile, 43% of the African population lacks access to electricity. Um, and most of that, nearly uh, most of that, is in the sub-Saharan Africa that which we're discussing. So now, on the same time, African nations argue they need investment to develop their energy resources, and they very often strongly mention uh, oil and natural gas. Senegal president, almost a year ago, Macky Sall, uh, stated plans by some countries to end the financing of natural gas exploration will prove a fatal blow to several emerging African economies. Um, recently, uh, African Development Bank President Adesina stated that Africa must have natural gas to complement its renewable energies. Uh, just a few days ago, I had a conversation in a hearing with the, um, one of the heads of the uh, Development Finance Corporation, DFC, and they were very strongly stating how their investments were for all of the above, and he meant that very technically not interested really in, in natural gas and oil. So th there's some real problems here because, and then you have John Kerry who recently stated he's, will, he's willing to admit that natural gas is an acceptable transitory, transitionary energy, which, okay, transitions, but uh, there's, there's time frames on transitions. My time frame is a lot longer than, than, than John Kerry's. They're looking at a seven-year transition, as you well know, to, uh, to, to 2030. That requires the heavy hand of government, not so much the innovation of the private sector. And the heavy hand of government, let's face it, very rarely works uh, throughout history. So, you know, I do realize this is why the administration refuses to issue 97% of the infrastructure permits here in the United States. But it's a losing plan because, A, it's very, very harmful to uh, those people who make up the African nations. But it's also a losing plan because the EU and China are, in fact, making these investments. And in the meanwhile, 
African nations are turning to coal uh, in, in mass quantities because of our ideological narrowness uh, and um, a sense of urgency on all of the above and not considering any of the below. So, you know, from you know, the USAID standpoint, what, how are you looking at this? You, you, Director, you were mentioning earlier about energies and, and, and uh, how important that is. So if you wouldn't mind commenting on what I just stated, Director, please. No, thank you so much for that question, um, Representative Musas. So from a USAID perspective, what we do is take a country by country, project by project, approach when we're evaluating um, energy uh, projects. So we look at whether how we move forward to advance global and national uh, climate um, goals, but at the same time within our systems, we work to ensure that while we're taking that renewable energy first approach, that we are uh, also able to consider carbon intensive uh, projects where the uh, less carbon intensive ones would not make sense uh, in a, for, for, for development goals. I don't know if that speaks to directly to your question. So we do have the ability to assess on a country by country. It's not a one size um, approach fits all approach. I, I, I appreciate that. Do you know that the Belt and Road, the China investments are overtaking our uh, investments in the, particularly when it comes to natural gas and African nations? Is that something, Secretary or Director, you can comment on? And I'm just about out of time. Maybe you can get back to me. All right, I, I appreciate that. And please, uh, this, is, this is very important, so I hope we could have a more of a open mind as well as a more logical approach to these resources. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, chair now recognizes Representative Omar of Minnesota for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, Assistant Secretary Fee, it's good to see you again. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Ethiopia. Um, how confident are you that the recent agreement is going to hold? Um, if you can talk a little bit about if, uh, Eritrea's role. Um, we noticed that the peace deal does not mention them. Um, and what do you think the assessment is uh, in attaining that peace or sustaining that peace? Hi, thank you. Um, I think identifying Eritrea is the weakness of uh, the challenge in front of us is absolutely correct. Uh, the uh, agreement refers to foreign forces. Uh, and last week in Nairobi, where there was a further elaboration of the mechanisms of implementing uh, the, the agreed cessation of hostilities, withdrawal of foreign forces, and restoration of humanitarian assistance and services, uh, there were the modalities were beginning to be discussed. Uh, the AU is also charged with setting up a border monitor, uh, monitoring mechanism that would also facilitate uh, uh, the withdrawal and the monitoring of the withdrawal of Eritrean troops. I'm confident that the people of Ethiopia, all of the people, all of the different communities, do not want this destruction and death uh, that they have been suffering from for more than two years. And I'm hopeful that with the support of the African Union, Kenya, South Africa, and the, the leaders of uh, the government and the TPLF who've uh, made courageous decisions to move forward on a negotiated path uh, with support from the United States and other members of the international community, that we can be successful in, in implementing the agreement. Yeah. And how do you see the United States' uh, role in um, uh, justice and accountability? As you know, it's most important to come from the people themselves. Uh, they have told us uh, that they are interested in, in pursuing accountability. Uh, the Minister of Justice from the government of Ethiopia has briefed the diplomatic corps that that's something the government intends to pursue. In the conversations that the Secretary has had, that Ambassador Hammer has had, that I have had with the parties we've made clear in order to restore uh, the full partnership that we previously enjoyed with Ethiopia, we would need to see action on accountability. Um, not only because of our values, but because Ethiopia won't be able to progress if they don't resolve the deep divisions uh, that have been created by these acts. Yeah. 
And if you can go back a little bit um, to Eritrea, uh, I previously talked to you about um, the, the possibility of uh, Somali troops being trained there. Um, I know when we previously spoke, you, you said you couldn't confirm. Um, it has now been confirmed that there are 5,000 um, Somali soldiers that have been trained. Uh, the president of Somalia says he doesn't have the resources um, to bring them back. Uh, is there a role for the United States to assist? I know that the ask was made. That subject is under discussion and also discussion with other regional and international partners, uh, such as the Emiratis and the Qataris and the Turks, who you know are also engaged in providing security assistance to Somalia. I think one question that we don't know the answer to is were any of those troops involved in the recent conflict, which would of course uh, not be an encouraging sign for their engagement um, in Somalia. So uh, that remains uh, an open question that we need to resolve before we would move forward. Is there an assessment being done on whether they participated in any of the um atrocities that the, we see. There are efforts of? underway to determine that, but as you know, we have very limited uh, visibility or opportunity to understand exactly what's happening in Eritrea. Uh, Assistant Administrator Muyangwa, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, the famine in Somalia. Um, as you know, uh, there is looming famine um, taking place in Somalia uh, at the moment. How much money is still needed at the international level in order to prevent famine in Somalia in 2023? No, thank you very much for, for that question. Um, based on our assessment and the international community's assessment that the money to Ethiopia for humanitarian assistance in that space will run out in uh, early 2023. I think it's May, April, You mean or Somalia? May. Somalia, sorry. Yes, okay. It's, it's early. Uh, April or May of 2023. And so there is absolutely a need to marshal the international community as well as other partners. Is the administration making a specific ask as we do our last budget? Uh, I'm not sure what the numbers are, but we can check on that and uh, provide that uh, figure to you. But I believe there has been uh, an ask, but I'd have to confirm that. Oh, wonderful, I know I'm out of time, but I would love to know what that number is so that we can push here in Congress as well. Sure. Thank you both. I yield back. Thank you so much. We're um, uh, just about to, at the end, we're going to do two more members, um, just so you can calibrate, beginning with uh, Representative Meyer of Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses and Assistant Secretary McPhee. It's good, or McPhee, not McPhee. Uh, I want to. Yeah, <laughs> it's wonderful to see you again. Uh, you were starting to mention the Wagner Group earlier, um, and I think for some Americans, the recent sledgehammer execution video of a former Wagner Group mercenary in Ukraine by his uh, colleagues who accused him of betraying them um, was a, a stark reminder of some of the violence this group has perpetrated you know, in Ukraine since 2014 and, and most uh, you know, dramatically since the, the February invasion, but also throughout Africa that I think slides a little bit more under the radar. Uh, and with that sledgehammer execution video, I think Evgeny Prigozhin said, you know, a dog receives a dog's death. So not exactly backing away from, from the brutality that we saw witnessed, uh, but contrasting that with the, you know, dozens, but confirmed, but more likely hundreds of civilian fatalities uh, that the Wagner Group has, uh, is responsible for fighting alongside Malian forces, uh, some of their work in, in the Central African Republic, um, a bit less of a clear line on their work in, in Libya and Mozambique as well. Um, can you speak to the current status of, of this administration's views on, on the Wagner Group? I know there's been some discussion on the possibility of them being listed as a foreign terrorist organization you know, by the State Department, getting on that FTO list. Can you speak to where that stands right now and what impact um, a potential FTO inclusion might have? Uh, thanks for raising this issue because it's such a concern for, for Africans and, and therefore uh, for us. Uh, Ambassador O'Brien would probably be better uh, uh, the better uh, source of information about what would be next in terms of FTO. You know we've sanctioned Prigozhin. 
um, and that we are working in tandem with the EU, for example, on other parallel sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, Under Secretary Newland recently traveled with an interagency group to the Sahel. Uh, she made very clear to the authorities in Mali uh, that they would have no prospect of ever resuming a relationship with us if they didn't cut that relationship with Wagner. Uh, she also engaged the transition authorities in Burkina Faso mm -hmm. uh, to urge them not um, to respond to Wagner overtures. Uh, and uh, and in the Central African Republic as well, we continue to press firmly uh, and to mobilize our partners active there. Uh, but we'll come back to you on the FTO thing. I, that's that's in the sanctions world. Fair enough. And, yes. and I guess one thing that's also been a little striking to me, I mean, Wagner Group has been going around to Russian prisons, at least according to open source reporting, going around to Russian prisons, trying to recruit convicts, you know, promising them a, a get out of jail free card, not the best deal in the world because that get out of jail free card goes through, you know, a meat grinder in Ukraine. But at the same time, they seem to be very hard up for personnel uh, to support the Russian uh, invasion and occupying forces there. They don't seem to be reducing, at least from what I've seen, their operations throughout sub-Saharan Africa. Can, can you speak to how that has maybe I get, I square that circle a little bit. It's one of the reasons why they're so dangerous in Africa, because they're extracting resources from African countries and funneling them back uh, to Moscow. So that's why it's so bad for Africa, right? Then they don't control their own resources and develop their own country. So that's our assessment, that that line of resourcing uh, is one of the reasons that they've kept uh, the footholds that they have maintained so far on the continent. Thank you. And, and you know, I returned from a congressional delegation with Chairman Meeks um, to the South Pacific, and, and obviously a very different competitive landscape there. But and I know this is important to the chairman. I think it's important to many of us on this <coughs> committee is making sure we're not leaving any territory up for grabs. That there aren't countries who have one offer on the table, um, and it's not from the U.S. We're all we're already going to be hamstrung because we actually abide by the rule of law, because we believe in international institutions, um, because we are not in the business of, of bribing or threatening or cajoling the leaders of these countries in ways that the Russians have no issue doing, the Chinese have no issue doing. Uh, a lot of the mal actors in the world are able to to take advantage you know, of that position. Uh, and I'm proud of how the U.S. acts and how the U.S. operates, but making sure that uh, as the chairman mentioned in his opening remarks earlier, that we are, as a committee, doing everything we can to support engagement and a presence and making sure that we are not leaving any territory or any country feeling like there's only one offer on the table and it's coming from countries that they would prefer not to work with because they know that what will be demanded of them in that transactional relationship, what will be required to be extracted from their country, is simply too high a price to pay. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, and finally, we will turn to Representative Young Kim of California for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. And I want to thank our Assistant Secretary Fee and Assistant Administrator Muyanga. Um, Huawei is very active in Sub-Saharan Africa and presents the United States with a significant obstacle to overcoming our efforts to promote secure global telecommunications and to compete with the uh, CCP's malign influence on the continent. Uh, Huawei has built around 70% of Africa's 4G networks, and they intend to complete control over 5G uh, networks in Africa. So I wanna ask you what the State Department and USAID strategy for promoting secure global telecommunications infrastructure in Sub-Saharan Africa is. Thank you for highlighting that challenge uh, that the Chinese face and we face in terms of our partnership with Africa. Uh, the, the State Department has recently established a new Bureau of Cyber Digital Policy uh, in part to help us uh, uh, attack uh, this challenge. Uh, we are also looking at mobilizing additional funds, uh, which Dr. Mande can also speak about, uh, in terms of a Digital Africa program that we would discuss at the upcoming Leaders Summit. Mm -hmm. uh, we we really want to work on uh, making sure that uh, that that the software, if, of, if you will, is secure uh, and that governing rules are important. I mentioned earlier uh, that we had mounted a successful campaign to have an American lead the UN body that sets internet rules, and we want to help build the capacity of African governments and societies, uh, uh, ensure that they have an internet that helps them develop their economies uh, and, and is uh, secure. 
Thank you so much uh, for that question. Adding on to what Assistant Secretary uh, Fee uh, mentioned, so the Digital Africa Initiative really speaks to the key concerns that you have raised uh, here today. And uh, we expect to unveil that at the upcoming African Leaders uh, Summit. In addition to that, uh, USAID is also working on very specific digital governance uh, issues uh, that speak to both um, misinformation and disinformation that tends to hollow out governance uh, institutions, but also um, hamper social cohesion uh, in communities. We are also working to ensure that there's adequate legislation uh, to uh, promote not just internet freedom, but also protect rights on and, and, and offline. So there's quite a lot that we're dealing, uh, doing in that space, and we'll be happy to provide you with more details. Sure. Um, can you talk about the challenges the United States faces in promoting private U.S. investment in securing the telecommunications infrastructure? And what is the administration's plan for addressing those challenges and bringing the U.S. private sector investment into sub-Saharan um, Africa? We've talked in this hearing about the importance of increasing private sector investment in Africa, uh, and that's a twofold process. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do more uh, to help identify opportunities uh, for American companies, uh, but in particularly uh, uh, in our role as engaging with governments, we also need to press African governments to take steps that ensure that they have a more predictable uh, transparent operating environment so our business feels confident that they can repatriate their earnings if there's or if there are disagreements they can be resolved uh, through a, uh, a reliable uh, judicial process uh, and and, uh, and other such uh, elements of a, of a good operating environment so it's a bit of push and pull we need to do more um, and they need to do better uh, to attract investment Thank you. I do want to get to um, getting your readout on the Secretary Blinken's uh, recent trip to uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda. Um, that was in response to rising violation. I mean, yeah, violence in Eastern DRC between government forces and M23 forces. So, can you give us a readout on that? Definitely one of the main reasons he in, in visited both Kinshasa and Kigali was to try and offer our good offices uh, to help reduce the tensions between the two governments and stop uh, the M23 activity. We also wanted to encourage really dynamic African diplomacy. So the East African community, uh, under the leadership of President Kenyatta, uh, is working on a two-track process, bringing in troops uh, to try and stop M23's advance and sponsoring a negotiation track with the armed groups in Eastern Congo, including M23. Uh, the Angolans are also actively engaged trying to help support. They previously ran a process known as the Great Lakes process. And the Southern Africans, uh, as part of the South African development community, are also engaged. Uh, the UN is engaged. So uh, the situation is not good. Hundreds of thousands of Congolese have been displaced by M23's um, unacceptable uh, offensive. Uh, but I am encouraged by uh, regional efforts, which we are attempting to support. Thank you very much. My time's up. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, member questions uh, are now concluded. So uh, in closing, I wanted to thank uh, uh, both of you, uh, Assistant Administrator Muyangwa and, of course, Assistant Secretary Fee for um, your uh, work on behalf of our country, your patience with us today for, for answering all of the questions uh, and committing to answer the ones that you couldn't today uh, in the coming days. Uh, we ask a lot of you. Uh, we ask you to resolve these conflicts and advance human rights and promote American investment and to compete with our adversaries that are also looking uh, to uh, exercise malign influence in Africa. Um, we also owe you something, which is to continue to provide the resources that you need to actually do those things. And I hope all of us on a bipartisan basis, I think what we see from this hearing is a great interest in um, uh, maintaining and enhancing American leadership in Africa. I hope we will all continue to work together to ensure that you have the resources to do that effectively. Um, with that, uh, the hearing is adjourned.